Good morning, Brew Daily Show. I'm Neil Fryman. And I'm Toby Howell. Today on the pod, Uber wants to replace soccer moms by offering rides to teens. And I want you to start thinking about your ideal condiment combination, because that will be relevant a little later. I'm always thinking about that. (laughs) Then we'll head down to Miami to check in on a much more subdued Bitcoin conference kicking off today before finishing off the show with some news about genetically edited salad. Delicious. Neil, it's Thursday, May 18th. Let's ride. All right, I just want to offer a warning uh, to everyone. Toby and I just drank the biggest and most potent cold brews in the history of coffee bean production. This is going to be an electric show. Well, I was going to say, I hope what you're about to hear will be coherent. I know. We'll be talking fast, giving you a lot of information. I do have a would you rather for you. Would you rather be so extremely tired that you maybe can't do anything or the other side of the spectrum where you're so hyped up on coffee that it's really uncomfortable. This is my hot take. I'm a pretty hype person always. So I'd rather be tired because over indexing on, on the, the jitters is, uh, it's going to make me bounce up and down in my chair a little too much. Right. And you didn't have coffee at all when you were in Spain, you said? Yeah, I was coffee free. So impressive. I know. You also probably woke up at 11 a.m. <laughs> like everyone else. <laughs> we there. don't need to talk about that. OK, uh, let's go to our first story. We're going to do a quick catch up on the debt ceiling drama. We haven't talked about it for a few days. The facts remain the same. If the government doesn't raise the debt ceiling, the U.S. could default on its obligations by June 1st and yada, yada, yada. Economic meltdown. <laughs> The good news is negotiations seem to be progressing in the past few days between Democrats and Republicans, which gave a boost to stocks yesterday. Both the Speaker of the House, uh, Republican Kevin McCarthy, and President Biden said they believe that a deal could be reached before the deadline. Biden declared yesterday, America will not default. So we're going to hold them to that. Uh, What are they still hashing out? Basically, Republicans want to tie a debt ceiling increase with cuts to government spending. They want more work requirements for people accessing safety programs. Programs. Uh, McCarthy said these were a red line for him in negotiations, and Biden shown a little openness on some of those programs. And there's also $30 billion worth of unspent COVID aid that could get clawed back under a debt ceiling deal. I think it's so interesting that we're fighting over $30 billion in COVID aid when in the grand scheme of things, it's a $31 trillion yeah. debt. So it's like peanuts on the this dollar. This is a small thing. Yeah, very small. I also think it's funny that Biden is like cutting short his international right. trip uh, to like get this done. First of all, it feels like a bad time to go on an international trip when you have this well, looming debt ceiling. This isn't just any international right. trip. This is G7 where uh, all of the big you know, leaders of the major democracies meet and they're meeting in Japan and Hiroshima. Um, and so Biden, I think, arrived in Japan today. And so they're going to talk about, you know, big stuff, including AI. And he is cutting his his uh, trip short to come back to the U.S. Republicans are hammering him on on leaving in the first place like right. you. Um, <laughs> but it is a big it is a big meeting that, you know, you have to show up to show your standing in the world. And it shows that because we can't get our house in order here, our stand, you know, our leverage and our soft power on the world stage is maybe diminished a bit because he's he's not going to Australia. He's not going to some other place. And they're like, yeah, you got you got you can't you're flying halfway across the world and you can't make a quick pit stop here because you have a mess back home. So this whole thing is kind of embarrassing for us on the world stage. It's always I mean, this happens fairly frequently and the same talking points often come up. And some of the more creative workarounds for the debt ceiling have been kind of tossed out there, one of which is invoking the 14th amendment which is the 14th amendment includes like a lot of things it's like a a landmark like civil rights uh amendment but there's also like this weird clause in about how the u.s basically is always good for its debt and it's kind of like unilaterally getting around the debt ceiling and so some people are saying like there was a letter from some major uh democratic politicians saying like listen biden just invoke the 14th amendment we don't want to be held hostage by republicans anymore but it would be a bad look in like kind of an unprecedented step so that's one of them the 14th amendment and then the second one is obviously minting a 31 trillion dollar platinum coin which is again one of the less serious workarounds for the debt ceiling but again the US treasury is technically allowed to mint a coin that has a it is a platinum coin and it can have any value it wants and again that that's like a funny thing that in in some circles people are saying just mint the coin yeah. but would also probably be a bad deal a, a bad idea and would have 
consequences that we don't really fully grasp yet. So those are the two though that you might see floating around the interwebs. As let's well. hope it doesn't. Let's hope it doesn't get to that. Meanwhile, corporate America is applying pressure. Jamie Dimon, uh, the CEO of J.P. Morgan, said that he's established a war room that is meeting weekly. Uh, to figure out what would happen to the economy and his bank if the U.S. would default on its debt. And then earlier this week, more than 140 top business leaders like Goldman Sachs' CEO, David Solomon, wrote a letter to the government saying that the government was already seeing or the economy was already seeing some stress from the debt ceiling uh, dispute. So. Well, Cor corporate America, they write strongly worded letters when they don't write <laughs> like things. Um, we're laughing now, but uh, we let's hope uh, June first. June first. Mark it on up. the calendar. Let's let's get it done before then. Uh, All right. Go ahead. Let's let's move on to uh, the ride sharing world, where Uber has kind of been crushing it recently. It has some product updates that I want to explain to you all. So yesterday at its Go Get event, it rolled out a bunch of new updates that are a big deal for people with kids, both young and old. The new updates include the ability to reserve a ride with a car seat, lets teenagers 13 plus use the service unaccompanied, and this is kind of my favorite one. You can also call an Uber using just a phone number, which is funny because that's something you've been able to do with taxis right. since like phones are invented. But Neil, I know you have thoughts on the teenagers getting the chance to use Uber. Well, it, yeah, it, I think that's huge. First of all, Uber wasn't, a, you couldn't take an Uber if you were under 18. And obviously we know that teens have worked around that yeah. and are still taking Ubers. But I, what we were thinking of before the show, we were talking about all of the awkward high school situations that you could maybe have skirted uh, <laughs> if you could call an Uber like that, you know, that awkward first date going to the mall for a movie and you're mom's driving you and I just trying to like it's actually kind of arm around the shoulder it's kind of sad though because that's such a rite of passage yeah. like you and like your first girlfriend getting dropped off at a movie by by your parents now it's going to be a, an uber driver so <laughs> it's kind of it's it's kind of a big deal because it's oh, a, yeah. it's a it's a bit of a shift in their strategy it's only like certain uber drivers will be approved to like carry these unaccompanied teenagers the parent can technically contact the uber driver at any point so you know there's going to be some like helicopter parents who say like why did you just take that left turn like <laughs> what are you doing there my kid is in the back of your yeah. car so it's but they, you have to think parents are both probably pumped and a little nervous pumped because how annoying is it to take your right. kid to <laughs> like hockey practice especially hockey practice early i know like Sally. that ice time you know you can't get it you can only get it like at 5 a.m 5 30 a.m so just to call an uber to do that or take your kid to school there you so go. it seems like it, it would open up a lot of uh freedom opportunities obviously there are always kind of safety risks when you're talking about kids and uber has you know installed some mm -hmm. safety features to present pre prevent that um my favorite of these updates though is this group rides thing did yeah, you see i saw that yeah that is awesome because we've taken ubers a bunch where it's like all right you have to drop you know, you have to get dropped off at First Ave and I have to go to Williamsburg, but how do we work this out on the Uber app? Now you can invite people to join you on a ride and they will drop you off on the most efficient route possible mm -hmm. and then charge each individual user the amount of time that they spent in the car. That's the best part. So that is a really useful app. Feature for, yeah, it, it saves like that awkward Venmo. Yeah. Uh, like, okay, so I didn't really ride the whole way, but you want to split this Uber? So yeah. that's great. And then just to zoom out real quickly, Uber is, is doing very, very well. Their shares are up 51% year to date. Their last quarter revenue was up 29% year over year. So this is like, Uber's like... Right. To... Uh, pedal to the metal. Yeah, excuse the pun, but it's pedal to the metal right now for, for Uber. Thank you. Had to get that out. All right, let's move on. Uh, yesterday, this is pretty crazy, Montana ban banned TikTok. Whew. No, not just like on government issued devices like a bunch of other states have. It literally banned it. TikTok can't operate on devices in the state and app stores are prohibited from making it available for download on its stores. Uh, this makes Montana the first U.S. state to completely ban TikTok. So the governor, Greg Gianforte, signed the TikTok ban into law yesterday. Reason says it protects Montanans' data and personal information from being harvested by the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, TikTok, as we know, has generated a lot of blowback in the U.S. because it is owned by a Chinese company, ByteDance, and lawmakers are concerned that the Chinese government could use it to spy and spread pop propaganda to Americans. Uh, but this is not over. The law 
goes into effect on New Year's Day 2024, and it will definitely face legal challenges. TikTok and free speech advocates like the ACLU have already criticized it, saying it is unconstitutional and violates the First Amendment rights of Montanans. Did I say that right? <laughs> I know. You Montan did, you did say it right. Montana Nights. Um, the first question that comes to mind when I heard this story is enforcement. Like, yeah. how are you truly going to enforce? They say that they're going to fine like Google and Apple if they have it in their app store, ten thousand dollars a day. Um, but like, if it's already on your device, this reminds me of like Flappy Bird. Weirdly, remember when Flappy Bird was like this huge app? I do not. Okay, well, it was like this crazy app, and then the guy like removed it from the app store, and like phones that still had uh, Flappy Bird pre-downloaded. Yeah we're like selling for a lot of money because like you couldn't download it anymore. So I wonder if something like that's going to happen with, with TikTok. And if you already have it downloaded on your phone, like what are they going to do? Delete it for yeah, you? So They won't let you do product updates. So it'll become a zombie app and become really hard. Right. But the secondary effects are kind of funny. Like, will there be TikTok border towns in Idaho <laughs> where everyone go goes and just like yeah. takes, a, takes a video of themselves yeah. in, in Idaho right across the border? I, I'm also reminded of the, the Pornhub story yeah. we did two weeks ago where Pornhub was restricted in Utah. And so you saw this huge boom in like VPN usage because VPNs allow you to access the internet from a different location. Yeah. And so I think that we're about to see something like that happen. If this, I mean, all this, if it actually goes right. through, which it, there's definitely, as you said, some first amendment. Yeah. Uh, the wall street journal quoted legal experts saying that a potential case would probably go in TikTok's favor, honestly, because this is unconstitutional and you can't just target it or we don't know if it's unconstitutional. It could very well be unconstitutional mm -hmm. uh, because it violates people's First Amendment rights uh, and it like unfairly targets a single company. Right. And so the governor is kind of uh, foreseeing this legal challenge and is saying he's also potentially going to expand it to other foreign owned social media apps. It was a really funny quote in the Wall Street Journal where because he said, like, we'll probably ban WeChat as well, which is a Chinese messaging app used by a billion people in, in China. But how many people are using WeChat in Montana, like a Chinese messaging app? So, but you can tell he's kind of thinking ahead and like what challenges yeah. might, might face this. But uh, we'll see. Uh, it, whatever happens in Montana will, will have much broader implications for uh, the federal government, which is also looking into potentially TikTok ban. All right, Neil, let's head to my home state of Florida, where one of the preeminent crypto conferences is about to kick off. I I am, of course, talking about Bitcoin 2023, which has been held annually in Miami for the last couple of years. But while I'm sure there's going to be lots of Lambos, lots of glitz and glam, this year's conference is a whole lot more subdued than in years past. First of all, Bitcoin's down 60% from its all-time highs. The Miami Heat play in Casia Arena instead of FTX Arena. And Miami Coin, a crypto tied to this very city itself, is down over 99%. So, Neil, Miami and their mayor, Francis Suarez, kind of hits their wagon to crypto and are feeling the pain now. How do you think the vibes are in Bitcoin 2023 right now? I mean, definitely subdued, like you said, but the, there are so many Bitcoin hardcore people right. that are probably just Bitcoin ride or die and are still living it up. Uh, so I think, you know, among the hardcore loyalists, it, it's still going to be a huge party. And I think all of the stragglers who were just kind of like Bitcoin curious in 20, <laughs> 2020, 2021 and last year uh, probably won't show up. Yeah. But it was it was pretty stunning to see how hard Miami leaned into Bitcoin. For sure. And I mean, crypto. <laughs> yeah. Like so Francis Suarez, the, the mayor, he actually is still taking his salary in Bitcoin. That was like a big thing that he he did during the boom, but he's still getting a salary in Bitcoin. Um, and then just like a sign of the times, this article that, that came out previewing the conference, what it did basically was uh, put previous year's conference and compare it to this year's. And like I said, like FTX arena is no longer around. One of the biggest luxury condo complexes that used to accept payment in crypto yep. no longer do so because FTX was used to actually support that payment system. So that's gone. And then, yeah, it's just, it's just kind of interesting to see like, the, compare the prices to when it was and just the the fervor is no longer there. Yeah, but you got an interesting DM from someone. I know, last yeah. Year. So when I was down in Miami, it was actually the spring oh, of 2020. Um, I, I tweeted out something critical about Miami and said like, ah, I don't know what the hype is. And I got a DM from Mayor Francis Suarez saying like, hey, here's my like <laughs> personal cell number. Like, I'm so sorry. Spring break is not indicative of Miami. So I do respect the hustle and uh, of... The, 
of Mayor Francis Suarez. And you kind of do see it reflected in the broader economic standing of Miami. So residential real estate prices are growing at the fastest pace in the nation. It also has the lowest office vacancy rate of 16.2% in any major US city. So like if you remove yourself from just the crypto conversation, yeah. Miami on a whole is still doing very, very well. Yeah, a, bu a bunch of traditional finance companies like Ken Griffin, Citadel right. are moving down there. JP Morgan's opening, opening up an office there. So I think there's the Miami boosters are starting to realize we don't need crypto. We're doing just fine without it. Yeah. It's just becoming a broader yeah, tech hub or traditional finance hub as well. So Mayor Francis Suarez, if you are <laughs> listening to this, uh, I appreciate the DM back all those years ago. All right, let's move to Neil's numbers, which uh, we're going to try to trademark like Taco Tuesday. Uh, <laughs> it's a segment where I share three interesting stats that I read from the week's news. Uh, number one, I'm not sure if it was possible, but there is an entertainment product that is making more money than Twi Taylor Swift's era tour. <laughs> it's the new Zelda game. Wow. The hype legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom sold 10 million copies around the world for the Nintendo Switch in the three days after it was released last Friday. Uh, Nintendo doesn't break down revenue figures exactly, but considering that the game is $70 a copy, $130 for the deluxe edition, it could bring in about $700 million, according to some estimates. That outpaces any box office debut this year and Taylor Swift's tour in terms of sales generated. It also could end up being the best-selling video game of 2023. The current pay setter is that, Hog or that Harry Potter game, Hogwarts Legacy, that sold 15 million copies and generated more than a billion dollars in sales. <sighs> video games, it's actually crazy. I love seeing like what the recipe is for one of these massive blockbuster video games. It's like the pre-established fan base that already knows the characters. It has to be released on a console that's also sold very well. Like the, the Nintendo Switch has sold yeah. incredibly, incredibly well. So all these like ingredients combined to make just like a massive debut for Zelda. I don't, we don't play it though. You, have, you I don't, don't have a I, I, I'm not a video game. I know, but I, I have heard anecdotally, like a lot of people are obviously playing it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's go to the second one. You know those modern touchscreen Coke dispensers that allow you to mix and match various sodas? So Kraft Heinz is now doing that for condiments. <laughs> the company is launching a remix dispenser that will spit out more than 200 sauce combinations. Here's how it works. You can choose between four different sauce bases, ketchup, ranch, 57 sauce, and barbecue. Then select enhancers like jalapeno and mango, and then set it in intensity level. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, those soda dispensers, like yeah. everyone would always do, like, I, we called them, like, I forget even what we called them, but you just put every single soda into one cup and drink it. Like the grand, I don't know. Yeah. Like the grand slammer. Yeah. Some like horrible cocktail. Who is going to do that with the sauce cocktail? You're going to do all 200 Me. flavors of sauces. I would. I wonder what would dominate. Probably, probably the, the spice level, right? Spice, well, intensity level. I yeah, don't know if that's the same level. as spice level. I think you should be able, I think there should be another level and you should be able to choose the sound it makes when it comes out. <laughs> oh, God. Like, that's like, horrible. like a classic ketchup fart one. Yeah. Or like more of like a gloop gloop. <laughs> oh, gosh. I'm imagining that sound now. It's not good. What's your condiment of choice right now? Like, what are you going for? Well, I'm going to give you a, a, a duo because this is a sauce combined. Yeah, yeah, a combo. It is ranch and buffalo, especially the ranch and buffalo from Chick fil A. That is such an undefeated combo. I love like the, the creaminess of the ranch with the spice of the buffalo. <laughs> that sounds pretty good. I have some thoughts on this, obviously. I've been good dipping back into the ketchup well. It's good. Just straight ketchup, just <laughs> sugar. It is so good. Sugar to me. All right, let's move on to the third one. Um, hockey used to be considered a northern sport, obviously, because of ice. Uh, but the south is taking over. The Stanley Cup semifinals begin tonight, and the four teams that made it have the lowest average latitude of any NHL Final Four ever. These teams are the Carolina Hurricanes, the Vegas Golden Knights, the Dallas Stars, and the Florida Panthers, and they have an average latitude of 32.8 degrees. It's also the first time that every team in the semifinals is located below the 40th parallel. The NHL has invested a lot in these southern teams, and it is absolutely paying off. I This is why I love Neil's numbers, because what an absurd <laughs> fact. Like, no one in their right mind would ever stumble across that, so I appreciate you for bringing that to my attention. But you're from Tampa, and, like, lightning are taking over the town, feels like. I know. Champa, more than any other sport. Yeah, like, it, there's the Rays, like, the Tampa Bay Rays having an amazing season. No one goes to their games. Obviously, the Bucks. now that when Brady was there, like, got a little bit more, but, like, I... 
anecdotally, like people love the lightning. Yeah. Because they're just so fun. Like pardon the pun again, but they're electric. The games are oh are so fun. They literally have these uh whatever those like Tesla balls are hanging from the ceiling and they shoot off yeah. electricity when they score. So it's very I fun. guess you don't need pond hockey, you know, have kids growing up with pond hockey or playing outside to have a big hockey culture. Yeah. Because you just put it inside and pump it with AC. In a ring. Spend a zillion dollars on energy, but that's Florida for you. All right. We have a really fun story to end the show today about gene editing. The big news, a new category of salad just dropped. There's this company out of North Carolina called Pearwise that has edited the genes of mustard greens in order to make them taste a little less bitter. It uses this technology called CRISPR to go in and literally modify the genes of the lettuce. And there's already restaurants carrying this like new category of salad. And CRISPR is definitely one of those things that you've heard that like, smart friend bring up where they're talking about this is the future of, mm -hmm. of, of, of like civilization. So people see it as this new frontier of science when you can go in and hypothetically install any number of favorable traits into food. For instance, you can make crops that produce a larger yield, resist pests and disease, and then also potentially require right. less water. So this is kind of a crazy scientific advancement. Yeah, the way they're, they're billing it as making it is making salad healthier. Because mustard greens kind of suck. They're <laughs> yeah. like bitter and a you don't, peppery. Yeah. they're peppery. They're like you don't actually like, you'd rather go for iceberg lettuce or romaine, <laughs> but those have very little nutrients. It's just kind of like eating water. Yeah. Um, so maybe, maybe if you can make these more healthy things uh, taste a little bit better, then people might go for it. What's kind of controversial though, is that you don't actually need to label these genetically edited foods as bioengineered because the argument is that all that they're doing when they're editing these genes is speeding up a potentially natural evolution. Technically, you could crossbreed mustard greens over generations to make them less bitter. Yeah. They're just saying we're doing the same thing just a whole lot quicker. So there's definitely going to be some debate around is right. should this be labeled because almost 75% of people who responded to a survey wanted gene edited foods to be labeled as such. So people definitely want to know like what's going on in their food, which is understandable. Yeah. So this is definitely not the last time we're going to no. talk about CRISPR edited foods. All right. Well, we were promised designer babies and we got designer lettuce. We'll, so We'll take it. We'll take it. Uh, you, that is our show. You can always email us with any questions or comments uh, at Morning Brew Daily at MorningBrew.com. Big thanks to our entire crew who made this possible. Uh, Bryce Beloff is our producer. Samantha Velas and Raymond Liu are the associate producers. Yuchenawa Ogu is our technical director and he is not a fan of putting teens in Ubers. I can tell you that. Billy Menino is on audio. Hair and makeup got banned in Montana. <laughs> Devin Emery is our chief content officer, and our show is a production of Morning Brew. Great show today, Neil. Let's run it back tomorrow. Time to watch some golf. <laughs>